anointed. And it was a symbol that God had chosen them and set them apart for service. And even though this was a ritual act, it spoke about a greater reality that was happening at that time, that was happening in the spiritual realm. It symbolized the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon that individual. And this anointing that John is speaking about, he's not speaking about a tingly feeling that you get. He's not talking about the ability to make people fall over. He's speaking about something much greater. It is not something that is only allowed and pertained to prophets and apostles. It is what we need in order to live the Christian life and to do the work of God. It is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And he says that you have an anointing from the Holy One. This is an anointing that comes from God. This is not an anointing that comes from man. No man can say, oh, I'm, I'm going to put my hand upon you and the anointing of God is going to come. No man can give you this anointing. This anointing only comes from the Holy One. God can use a man to confirm it. God can use a man to confirm that which he has spoken over your life. But he, a man cannot give it to you. It only comes from the Holy One. And it is this anointing that separates us. Because in fact, when we look at the, the Holy Spirit, not only is it a spirit, but first of all, he's holy. And the essence of what holiness is, is means to be set apart. And what makes a Christian holy is that the Holy Spirit dwells inside of them. And consequently, because the Holy Spirit dwells inside of them, they will live a holy life because the Holy Spirit gives them the power to be able to have victory over sin. You see, victory over sin in our lives doesn't come from our own inner strength. It comes from the power of God. The Bible says that through the Spirit that we put to death the deeds of the flesh. Through the power of the Spirit do we have the ability to submit to God. Through the power of the Spirit are we able to obey and do that which God has called us to do. In fact, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is so important that Jesus had to receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit before he even began his ministry. When we look in the book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 38, the apostle Peter says something very important. Well, starting in verse 37, he says, That word, I say, that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism of which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So the Bible shows us that Jesus was anointed not with a specific power, but with the very presence of God through the Holy Spirit. See, the anointing is not a thing. It's a person. And unless we have the person who's God living inside of us, we have not the ability to be able to do what God has called us to do. When Jesus begins his ministry, he tells us in Luke chapter 4, verse 8, why it is so important to have the anointing of the Spirit of God. Jesus, in the beginning of his ministry, he starts out with these words in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And then he's going to say why he needs the anointing. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, if Jesus needed the anointing 
of the Holy Spirit, how much more do we need it in our lives? And Jesus tells us what we need the anointing for. The very first thing he says, they preach the gospel to the poor. Brother and sister, you and me, though we may memorize and understand the concept of the gospel, though we may be able to pass a test on what the gospel is, we have no ability to be able to preach it in a way that would penetrate the heart of the unbeliever unless we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You see, when we testify before unbelievers, it is not just our words that allows them to believe. It is the conviction that comes through the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit working in that person's heart to not only understand those words, but to believe them. If Jesus needed the anointing of the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel, then what makes us think that we, in our flesh, in our intellect, have the ability to bring anybody to the feet of the Lord, to the cross, to come and understand, to receive this wonderful gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ? We cannot, brother and sister, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to preach, and not just the gospel, but to preach the word of God so that it can penetrate the hearts of other believers as well. And then he says, And he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He was anointed to preach, and through that anointing, he comes to heal the brokenhearted. There is no way, brothers and sisters, that we can counsel, that we can minister to someone's emotional need, psychological need, without the power of the Holy Spirit. There is no way that we can proclaim liberty to captives without the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible gives us an example of a group of men in the book of Acts called the sons of Sceva. And the Bible says that these men, they try to use the name of Jesus, whom Paul preached to cast out demons. And because they were not filled with the Spirit because they were not true believers. Though they used the name of Jesus, they were not able to cast out a demon because they did not have the power of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, in order to minister deliverance, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says, I'm recovery of sight to the blind. Brothers and sisters, we have no ability to show the truth to anyone without the power of God. Because God is not only after the mind, but he's after the heart. We can preach intellectual sermons all day long, but it is the power of the Holy Ghost that allows that trip, which seems to be a short distance, but is miles and miles away, the intellect and the heart. He allows that message to penetrate the heart and not just the mind. He says to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to minister. And I want to look at another verse that goes in conjunction with this. It is also an important verse, and it's the, the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verse 2. Oh, let's look at it from verse 1. It says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. John tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, that we have this anointing, and that we have no, no need, and that we know all things, he says. And what he's not saying that we have all knowledge, but because we have the Holy Spirit, He is our teacher. Because we have the Holy Spirit, He enables us to receive revelation, to receive the truth, because it is the Holy Spirit that testifies of Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit who gives us gifts and enables us to do specific things. And here, speaking about when the Spirit of the Lord rested upon Jesus in Isaiah, Chapter 11, verse 2, which Jesus says that 
he has been anointed. And we saw that Peter tells us that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. And here, Isaiah goes into specific details of why we need the Holy Spirit. And he says, the very first one, he says, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of wisdom. We need the spirit of wisdom. We need to be, the uh, Jesus Christ said, he says that we should be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Without the Holy Spirit, we have no ability to be able to stand against the, against the attacks of the devil, against the attacks of the world and the enemy. And he says wisdom and understanding, because those two things go together. Because in order for you to exercise wisdom, then you also must have understanding. To understand what? The scriptures. To understand situations and circumstances and to view them from God's eyes through the Holy Spirit. And he says the spirit of counsel and might. Brothers and sisters, one of the things that we are to do is to give counsel to each other. The Bible says that with counsel, make war. With right counsel, make war. And if you are a pastor, if you are a leader, if you are a brother and sister in Christ, and you have to counsel others, and we have no ability to do such thing without the Holy Spirit. And then he says the counsel and might. And might is the power, the strength, the courage to be able to stand like we see the apostles stand in the temple, broadly proclaiming, filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he says, a spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. A spirit of knowledge to receive knowledge of the spirit of what a communication that he wants to send us from God. And not just communication. And then the last thing he leaves, the last thing he says, is says, and of the fear of the Lord. Brother and sister, a person who does not have the Holy Spirit does not fear God. That's why a Christian, that's why it separates us, a Christian, a true Christian, from one person that merely calls themselves a Christian, is the fact that that Spirit of God dwells in them. And that they have fear of the Lord. When, when the Bible speaks about fear, he speaks about reverence, respect, honor. A Christian that has the Spirit of God honors God, respects God, gives reverence to God in all circumstances, holds Him in importance in our lives. And that's why a person that goes and prays about a certain situation, a person that is seeking God's will, he fears God. He's showing reverence in that he is seeking God's counsel in the matter so that he can do what is right and please the Lord in all his ways. Brother and sister, it is the Holy Spirit that makes a difference in our lives. It is the Holy Spirit in us, which is the deciding factor, whether we will make it to the end in our Christian walk. We ought to seek each and every day to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't just happen one time. The Bible specifies that we are to be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit, especially as we grow and mature more in the faith. We are to get greater and greater fillings of the Holy Spirit because without it, we will fail. We need the anointing. Amen. I would like to just take a look at a couple of points here. Brother Javer spoke about the anointing being as something smeared with oil. Well, another word for smeared is rubbed. And you know, a lot of us that live down here in Florida or where there's a lot of sun out, especially in the summer, we use suntan lotion. And what we do is we smear it over our body to protect us from the sun, from the sun's rays, so that that way we don't get burned. When we read here in verse 19 and 20, to try to understand what our brother John is talking about here, it says, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed 
that none of them belongs to us.